Welcome to the sixth season of the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy, and to kick off season six, yes, this is our 46th episode. Right here is Sadie Dupuy, best known as the leader of the band Speedy Ortiz. She also releases music under the name Sad 13, which is just a different way to stylize Sadie. And in fact, she releases Haunted Painting, her second full-length album under the Sad 13 moniker, next Friday. In this far-reaching conversation, we talk a lot about Pavement, which was a big influence on her, and a band I loved dearly growing up in the 1990s. And in the portion before we began recording the interview, we discussed how Pavement also inspired her personal email address. So you'll hear us allude to that. And we also go on an unexpected Joanna Newsom tangent. Anyway, Sadie grew up with music always in her family, and she says she has trouble pinpointing exactly where it began for her. Let's let her tell you all about it. It's so it's so hard for me to pinpoint an exact one because it's just been a part of my entire life. Um, it'd be like trying to remember the first thing I ate. My... Which was? Which was what? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, it was a filet mignon. Um, <laughs> no, both my parents weren't really, didn't really play music. My dad did to some extent, but, um, he worked in the industry though, right? He had way before I was born. Yeah. My dad had kind of like random and not low level, but he had sort of random A and R jobs in the seventies. He had worked with a bunch of no wave bands and he lived in new Orleans and worked with a couple of blues artists doing management. He had sort of done random music industry gigs. He worked with an early music video network, free MTV, uh, that he edited out of one of the punk clubs in New York. So he was sort of around and on the scene. Um, and my mom was as well. She had written for Punk Magazine. She had worked for a reggae label. She had assisted like Waylon Jennings tour manager. But this is all sort of in the in the 70s when they're in their early 20s. By the time I was born, maybe 10 years later, um, they, had, they had been out of it for about 10 years, but they stayed very devoted music fans. Um, and I always grew up listening to WFMU, WFUV. My dad had one of those cool old jukeboxes that have the, the bubbles going around them. So Ooh. I remember him playing like Kink Seven Inches for me. Uh, we would sort of dance around the house to that. So I, I, it was just kind of always playing in the house. And my dad played a little bit of piano. So I, I played with him a little bit as a, as a kid. And that's sort of my, my first memories of being involved in music at all. Did, did they have like a best story uh, that you would always like tell that one again you know, <laughs> from their time in the industry? The one that really cracks me up is that my dad uh, apparently played keyboards with television for a rehearsal. And they, they after one rehearsal, they were like, we're more of a guitar band. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> He could have changed the course of history. That's true. Was was that like when they were starting out or had they like already done an album? I think it's super, super early on. They might not have even been called television yet. That's amazing. Okay, so music was always around, but what what was the first instrument you picked up or the first time you realized that you could not only appreciate it, but partake in it? Um, I started taking piano lessons on like a little Casio keyboard. I lived in New York City, um, <laughs> probably around age eight, sounds true. I sang in children's choirs growing up as well. And I was in one that toured internationally from ages 10 to 16. So those were kind of the first things I started doing in terms of performing music publicly. What kind of choir stuff? Was it like a classical thing or contemporary songs at the time? Or? It was a, a mixture. Not, I mean, not, not contemporary like Glee, like right. contemporary, like, you know, every measure is in a different time signature and all of the vocal parts are clashing with each other. Occasionally oh, wow. we'd get um, some compositions like that. But it was a lot of like early 20th century Russian music or, you know, sometimes classical giants. Uh, that. So that was your first exposure to music as something you'd be reading then that uh, i mean i played i had to read sheet music for piano but that was sort of a big crash course in having to sight read and pick things up quickly it was mm-hmm. really intensive there was a director of the choir who had like won grammys with the choir and he was very 
he really drove the kids hard in a way that as someone who later went into teaching, um, I can't really fathom directing <laughs> kids in this way, but we'd, we'd often rehearse eight hours a week. Um, and that is when we weren't heading out on a tour. So it was learning a lot of music, making sure it was perfect. And yeah. Did you love it? Or was it like, what, what was that movie with JK Simmons? Or? Oh my God. I was just talking about him. My own, the only JK we have left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, the drum, drum movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was fully drinking the Kool Aid. I loved yeah. it, and certainly it gave me a, a really invaluable music education. I think it informed a lot of what I like in music, even in totally different genres. In hindsight, it, it, it like ate up all my time from ages ten to sixteen. I sometimes had to leave school like two weeks early before the semester ended, and I wasn't in a public school. They weren't too pleased with me for that, but I was extremely dedicated to it. Yeah, I, I loved it in hindsight. Maybe not super healthy for for a pre and early teen. And, and your parents were totally supportive of getting yeah. you out of school for that. <laughs> it was not a unified front all the time. My parents split up really when I was born, so okay. my mom was always very on board with all of this stuff. My dad, who was you know the parent without custody from afar, was like, "What are you doing, pulling her out of school?" Right, right. Did you form friendships that have lasted? And did anybody stay in music and go on to do something as notable as you? Yeah, in different corners of music, I think. I had a friend, Chelsea Knox, who we we played in like a band together outside of this. I started in the chorus at age 10, but I started playing guitar right around when I turned 13. Uh, and she and I started playing together and we would go play church basements and stuff like that as like a little band. Um, and she's gone on to be a pretty prominent flautist. I think she was playing with the Met Opera. She's been in a number of orchestras as like first chair flute. Is that the, the position it would be? She's like a, a serious performer. Now, we're not incredibly in touch um, other than through social media, which is probably too true for a lot of people I was friends with 20 years ago. But I've sort of watched her, her career from afar and that's been cool. Yeah. And I remember a number of years ago reading, uh, I mean, this is something we'll get into a little bit more with your journalism career. Um, but I remember reading an interview you did with Ellen Kempner, who was your roommate at the time. And uh, you were talking about this camp that was very special to both of you. Yeah, that would probably have been the bigger impact on the music I play now. I went mm -hmm. to a uh, performing and creative arts camp called Bucks Rock that I, I started going to when I was 13. That's where I first started playing guitar. So I started playing in bands there, and, and that's when I started learning how to record. They had a studio, um, and I would go in every summer and make like an EP. It was really like the first time I met other other girls who were interested in sort of the music I wanted to play. Like there was a, a Locust cover band at the camp that was all girls. Wow. Um, <laughs> pretty cool. Certainly not happening at my rural public school. You, you tried to start a gay straight alliance at your high school and you got <laughs> yep. in trouble for it? I did, yeah. That is insane. <laughs> yeah, I wonder all the time about what's going on at my high school and whether everyone's okay. So I, gr I grew up in New York City. My parents were um, split up, but I grew up, I was in New York between their two houses, apartments for the first big chunk of my life. And then my mom moved up to rural Northwestern Connecticut when I was in middle school, which is a huge culture shock. Um, as someone who had previously been in New York public school, it was extremely, extremely white. And even for me to be Jewish was like crazy <laughs> at the school. Um, so just like the casual racism was so intense. Uh, and I just really wonder about with all the, you know, people reckoning with their own racism, um, I wonder a lot about what happened at my high school um, and right. continues to happen. But yeah, it was, you know, very um, small town, a lot of people working on farms and families that have been farming there for like 200 years straight up. So yeah, queerness was not really something that was part of the cultural language there. And I wasn't like out as bi, but I was. And I had been sort of lucky to go well I don't know about lucky um, I had a bad experience but I went to a boarding school for one year before going to this high school that was public which Lana Del Rey was another student at uh, it was a lot of like super rich kids doing coke which was really not me or my my vibe so I clocked one year there but they did have a great GSA and all of my friends were sort of part of that scene and when I went back to public school it was like why can't we have this here and um, yeah it was just something that, that was deemed inappropriate which is crazy, but I'm, I'm so thankful that I had the summer camp to go to in the summers where 
you know, as I said, like one of the the camper bands was like three girls with shaved heads playing like locust songs. So I think if I hadn't had that influence, um, I would have turned out totally different because it was really affirming to me just like, oh, there are other kids that, that like the stuff I like and think about the things I think about. They just aren't gear <laughs> right right in the, in, in the fall and the winter tell me a little bit about when you first started writing and and what was either you know influencing it uh musically with, with other bands you were listening to or you know the the people at the camp or i guess just tell me a little bit about when you first started to compose i remember making music. up songs probably around when I started playing piano, like eight years old. And I still kind of remember some of the songs that I made up then. But as far as a song all the way through that I could play to you now, I I started playing guitar around 13. And I think um, within a year, I started writing songs that I could record. So uh, at that time, I was really into like Weezer, Deftones, a lot of rock band. That was a weird time with uh, Weezer was absent for a while. And like uh napster was huge and i remember deftones were doing a lot of weezer covers so it's weird that you mentioned those that might have even been how honestly so many of the bands that i got really into at that time i didn't have napster but i had kazaa um Mm -hmm. and you would like type in weezer and get returned 20 bands that weren't weezer but kind of sounded like them so i got really into the rentals um self i think super grass might have maybe maybe super drag deftones certainly all these things things that were labeled as weezer but weren't actually weezer um, that's funny and you could hear that they weren't weezer and it was like the the searching through message boards to try to figure out what you had received that was mislabeled as weezer i think there's a sugar ray song that was uh, tied up in all of that rivers oh yeah he had i think he had yeah rivers he had a song about him <laughs> from the scream 2 soundtrack the missing year yeah yeah it's kind of funny, though, when people talk about the way music is consumed now, there's always pining for bygone days about like, oh, I remember I like could tape it off the radio and then I like went to the record store and found it and but they didn't have it. So I bought an earlier album. But there's not as much pining for Kazaa and then the mislabeled Napster uh, search results. It's kind of funny. I love discovering stuff by accident. I think that's my favorite way to find music and it's become a lot harder. Some of the things I've connected to most, it's because I heard it playing in a restaurant and had to like flag down the specific staff member that was playing that to find out like what CD was in. It's just a, it's a little more challenging to to find things and make a connection with them that way. Not to say like, you know, it was so great when we couldn't figure out what everything was, but I do miss finding things sort of more by accident, like being in the used CD bin and picking up the $1 thing because it had cool art and finding out it was awesome, even though um, no one no one ever bought it. Right. And, that, and there's also, there's something to be said about asking the person responsible at the restaurant what that is, because you're establishing a connection rather than just holding up Shazam on your phone. Mm-hmm. Trying to remember what it is, the whole car ride home until yeah. you can get back onto your computer. Or just to a pen and paper. So, okay, you're listening to, you know, Weezer and Deftones <laughs> that you've discovered accidentally. And is the music you're making at that time, does it reflect that? Or do, does any, do any of the, these songs, including the songs you remember from being eight years old, do any of them ever get reimagined to anything you've ever put out? Um, I did put out the songs I made when I was like 13. Because I started making EPs around age 14 at the camp. Um, and I actually revisited a bunch of them recently for a different podcast. Oh, and that's fun. they're simultaneously like, they're, I mean, you know, I'm 14 years old, but they're kind of not bad. I wasn't, I wasn't coming out the gate terrible. The stuff from when I was eight, I was really into ska at that time. My parents had sort of been into, my mom had, had I think I said, worked with a reggae label and also done ska stuff. They'd come out of. What label was it? Um, I don't remember the name. She's going to kill me. It's not, certainly not <laughs> one that exists anymore. Okay, It wasn't like two-tone or something. No, no, no. But she yeah, lived yeah. in the UK for a little bit. But I did love the specials, and I certainly had like two-tone compilations. Um, and that was what I was really into, kind of for, for a lot of my life. So the stuff I was working on when I was like eight years old, I really liked No Doubt. So I was trying to do, to make stuff songs like that. Uh, but I no, I have not... Um, I have not gone back to record the, the stuff I made in elementary school. Maybe 
maybe now that I will never tour again is the time. Oh man. How are you <laughs> handling all that? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I mean, and, and especially having, did, did you have tour plans for this album when you made it? What, oh, yeah. How long ago did you finish the latest album? In terms of like recording and mixing, I finished it in December. Mm-hmm. So um, you had no idea about anything. No, 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 no. Yeah. yeah, this was all done well before. It's okay. I'm, we're all making do. Did you have tour plans that you had to cancel? Yeah, uh, I've canceled stuff really. Um, I had stuff March, April, May, June, uh, August, September. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, man. and probably beyond because the record's coming out in September. But that's all right. that was, was planned. What have you been doing in lockdown? Uh, I run a an imprint for my record label called Wax9. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I started pretty early on was um, a poetry journal offshoot using the label's website. I have so many, I mean, primarily my friends at this point are in music and writing just because that's where I've worked for long enough. And pretty much everyone makes their money off touring or working in service industries when they're home all of which was obviously shut off in March. So I started a a little poetry journal that pays poets, which is unfortunately kind of (laughs) increasingly rare. One of the things that I I put out a book uh, two years ago, a lot of people who I I think are pretty organized find working in music frustrating because the communication is often pretty bad and people just aren't always exceptionally organized. But whatever complaints I might have had, poetry world is like much more chaotic. And the contracts are really ridiculous. I feel like writers don't get a very fair deals from very, very indie publishing houses. So I started this little poetry journal as a way to just, you know, 50 extra bucks for groceries in a time when you can't make any money is um, sort of a boon. At least it is for me when I get offered anything that's paid. So I've been running that journal for the past five months almost. Um, and that's been really fun and gratifying. I've been asked to work on a number of um, compilations of doing like cover songs and stuff like that. So I've been trying to get better at the home recording and mixing and watching YouTube tutorials about different ways to EQ things. Oh, are you doing that stereo gum cover? I did. Yeah, I did a cake cover, which is another thing I really liked around the the Weezer Deftones era. Oh, that's fun. What song did you do? Symphony in C. Oh, cool. Yeah, I really love to do covers as like faithfully as possible, which is probably somewhat boring for some listeners, but as a production exercise, it's really fun for me. So that's been been something fun. I haven't really been interested in working on new creative work, not only because there's just so much going on in the world that um, I just, I'm just not interested in like producing new create, creative stuff right now, but um, something like that that's more puzzle-like is really fun for me. You'd mentioned your poetry book and one of the things you wrote in an intro to that really resonated with me. I have my notes here, so I'll read it. Um, I hope I remember what I said. This is... It just got me thinking. So you, you wrote about when you were coming out of something, the poems got simpler, lighter, chipping away at all the ornate language that used to hide my poetic anxieties led to a darkly funny core, something a little less witchy with a few more punchlines. And I was just thinking about that in terms of poetry and, and music and how the ways we communicate in art, whether we choose to veil them, uh, as you say, like chipping away at the ornate language or just be simple and light. And I, I wanted to ask your thought on that. When you consider your lyrics, when do you veil it and when do you just go for simple and light? I don't know if I go for simple and light too much in, in the lyrics, but I think what I probably meant when I wrote that when when I do poems, I tend to write way, way, way more than than ever is the final version. Um, I'll write like three pages and wind up with ten lines. And I'm a huge fan of scrutinous self editing and cutting. And I feel that way in arranging music too. Not so much, I guess, not so much in the arrangement of the you know all the different tracks. Um, I'm very maximalist in that department and have been told over and over again, like, why do you have so many synth parts that are nearly identical except deviating from one note? Um, I think that's <laughs> some, like children's choir mentality. But in terms of the, the song structure itself, if there's anywhere to cut something down and just inject something weird, but have it not be noticeable, that's like what I'm constantly going for. So if there's anywhere to cut one beat, I'm always trying to do that. 
if there's a way to have the second verse be drastically shorter or to get rid of some instrument in that section or just change things up slightly and, and keep it so we're moving along. I don't, I don't really ever want to repeat something or get in a groove. I know that's what <laughs> tremendous amount of music is for. And I feel like my mission is to just not allow that to happen in my own songs for some reason. So I'm always looking at ways of cutting down sections. So the second time they recur, they're not quite the same as the first. And yeah, I think that's sort of similar to the poetry thing. If I feel like a word is redundant, there's no reason to have it in there. Let's just get to the next thought. I want things to be really tight and crisp in terms of the form. I think it kind of applies to both the the songwriting and the poetry. I, I guess I was thinking about it because of thinking about pavement and thinking about how those lyrics never made sense to me, but they resonated with me, you know? I think I really gravitate towards stuff like that. I want the language yeah. to be cool and to make me puzzle over what it could mean or um, just be an awesome phrase that I didn't expect. And I don't really... I'm, I, something that I think I always feel like guilty about when I talk about lyrics, especially because I think a lot of what people like about my bands is the lyrics. It's always like the last thing I notice when I'm listening to something. Songs that are my favorites that I've heard a million times that I could hum along to every part, I might not know any of the words to. So certainly when I'm writing music, it's the lyrics are the last thing I work on, which is not to say I don't put a lot of time and, and thought into them. But I'm not really trying to make like a, a sing along or something that's like easily digestible because it's it's not how I come at thinking about lyrics as a fan. So I'm mostly thinking like, will this look cool on a page for the person who's already heard the song eight times and only now is going to look at the lyrics and is going to think like, oh, that's what that's what is being said. I'm not really ever going for like a, a super straightforward line that's repeatable, which mm -hmm. to, to my detriment, probably, but it's just what I happen to like. And um, I can't lie to myself. <laughs> no, that works perfectly. I mean, it's it's uh, that is an interesting thing. And I think a lot of people do that. I, I do that myself is I'll, I'll listen and listen and listen and then be like, you know what? I really like this song. I'm, I'm going to take this to the next level and I'm going to really listen what what's being said, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's not my primary listening mode, but it's like my deep fandom listening mode to, right, to finally right. pull up the lyrics. And then you're like, oh, what, what did they say on Genius about that? <laughs> yes. Have you uh, gone on to Genius for your own songs to see what anybody has, has said as far as interpretations? I did a weird interview a couple of years ago with, I think Genius had hired Sasha Freer Jones like, oh, fun. early on. And we did a long interview. Um, and he just annotated all my songs with like anything I had to say about what alignment. Oh, wow. So that was kind of cool. I probably, I think I must enunciate really badly. And it's probably because I don't think of like the vocals as the centerpiece of any of these songs. Uh, mm -hmm. But people get them drastically wrong and generally always <laughs> simplify them and make them a little more um, emotional than whatever it is that I wrote. But uh, yeah. I do enjoy reading the wrong lyrics. It's pretty fun for me. It's interesting, though, because you are somebody who has such a prolific output in just expression with language. And it almost feels like so you, you have poetry and you write articles and you write lyrics for songs. And I guess it's like, where where does each one go? It's like, oh, I have this idea. This will be good for an article. I have this idea. This will be good for a poem. This this will be good for a song. But you say that when you're doing songs the lyrics just come at the end. Yeah, exactly. So I'm not like squirreling away song ideas generally. Honestly, a lot of the songs I get, I'll have an idea when I'm not near any way I could play or record them. Driving or, you know, showering. I think this is pretty common for a lot of songwriters. Um, I'll get a great idea for a melody. It might be a guitar part or a vocal part, but some sort of central melody. And sometimes when I when I have those ideas, there's vowel sounds attached to them or like a nonsense phrase, and I'll just sing it into my phone. And then when I have time to sit at my computer, and I don't really write without home recording, um, just because there are so many layers to all these songs. It's I don't really consider like just the the melody and the chord changes the song. It's like the whole arrangement. So when I have time to sit at the computer, I'll go revisit all the voice memos. Um, and maybe if there is one sentence attached to one of the melodies that'll sort of dictate to me, all right, maybe the song could be about this based on my interpretation of whatever I sang in the shower six months ago. But often I'm, I'm just trying to get to the, the full arrangement of the song and maybe there is some 
topic I want to write about because of whatever's going on in the world that day. And I'll sort of write to that. With the the music, do you write with the other members of Speedy Ortiz? No, I, can't, I write everything. Yeah. But I mean, certainly they're like, sometimes the, the bass part that I came up with is like stupid and <laughs> someone <laughs> will have a much better idea or the, the drum part I came up with is not humanly playable and what the drummer came up with is much better. But in terms of the song itself, it, it stays pretty close to the demo I send everybody. Right. So how do you figure out which is going to be a Speed Ortiz song and which will be a Sadie song? Or I, I I do pronounce it Sadie, right? I don't do Sad 13. It's Sad 13. I do Sad 13. I know, That's but funny. everybody does this. It's, I <laughs> should have had the foresight when I... As I was like about to say it just now, I was like, there's no way it's Sad 13. It's It's got to be Sadie, right? It's, um, well, it's funny. When I started using Sad 13, which I made up as a DJ name to do something for She Shreds, uh, I was like, this is a funny name. Um, I really like the, ba- the band Brainiac. And they sort of stylized their name in Leet Speak, but it's pronounced Brainiac. So following that, my my band name should just be Sadie. But um, no, it is, it is Sad 13, which to me okay. was just sort of a funny expression and capsule. What word am I trying to say? I have not slept all week. Um, <laughs> encompassing what it feels like to be a songwriter, just like a, a mopey early teen. The Sad 13 project started just because I'd been doing so much with Speedy for years, and that band had started as my home recording project, um, and I no longer had any outlet for home recording. So I really started Sad 13 just so I could have something where I did get to play every instrument, which was something I really liked doing and, and sort of missed. And initially, Speedy hasn't done... Before our most recent album... There wasn't too much synth heavy stuff or drum machine stuff. Just by nature of budget, we'd be in studios and we could only afford four days. So that's enough time to get all the, you know, guitars and bass and drums and some vocals and some backup vocals and maybe a couple, you know, you get a Wurlitzer on one song, but it's not time to get really deep into overdubs. And so by having a, a home recording project where the time was unlimited, I could stay up from 9 a.m. to 6 a.m. the next day and just program every synth idea I had. Um, so I really just wanted a project where I could do do that and explore every idea that came to me and not have to worry about recreating it in a studio with you know three other people. So that was sort of the initial idea behind the project. But what's funny about this album is, of course, you always want to get get a little better and try the next thing. And, and this one, I wound up absolutely recreating everything in a studio so i'd Mm -hmm. be sending to the engineer i I worked on this album at studios kind of around the country just in between speedy's festival dates so i would be like all right i'm gonna have two songs to do at this studio next month between these two festival dates so i would write them and they'd have you know like 100 different tracks on them and i'd just be spending the whole month like practicing all these little tiny synth parts because although i started on piano I'm really not very good at it and I haven't spent time on it in years. So very simple synth parts take a long time for me to do. And then there'd be like a hundred of them. So um, it was a lot of like cramming in a way that I haven't had to do since I was in college uh, just to, to record on like an analog synth that can't speak MIDI. But it was really fun. There's no overlap between the two projects, right? Like the Speedy Ortiz ever do a Sad 13 song? No, we haven't. Although I wonder about I feel like by the time touring is possible, you know, maybe I'll be wanting to work on another Speedy record. So maybe we'll somehow combine them. I see that, you know, if Camper, Van Beethoven and Cracker can tour together all the time, then maybe um, I can do both these projects on one tour. That's true. Don't they call it like Cracker Von Beethoven <laughs> I'm sure, or something? I think they do, yeah. Have you ever done that song you did with Lizzo? Did you ever play that out anywhere? No, as... which is kind of a bummer because I think... It is a bummer. It's great. It's a really fun guitar part. I had a great time making the, the song, but I don't know what we would do with so much of it is, is Lizzo's verses. I think we were going to play it together for something for Google and then it didn't happen. So uh-huh. that song's never been played live. Maybe someday. There's a song on the last 13 record that has Samus on it. Um, one of my favorite producers, rappers, songwriters, and we did play that song out and I would just get different 
I would record samples of different poets I like from YouTube. And during Samus's like verse, I would just manipulate them in Ableton and that would be the the, the rap break. Oh, that's cool. Um, which is kind of fun. So do you have a, a Ableton push that you use? I use the like Akai Ableton controller for, for Sabatine. Oh, cool. Um, it's kind of a pain in the butt. And I'm the nice thing about touring being canceled for the year is I haven't had to remix all these songs as different Ableton tracks that I can play with live. Right, right. Um, I've spared myself a lot of hours of work despite being living in a pandemic. <laughs> um, so if we could go back a little bit, um, let's see, where did we leave off in the chronology? Um, we're, we're doing like a bunch of time jumping, but... I know, sorry. I, I watched uh, Palm Springs. I'm just in a time loop. Oh, wasn't it so good? I really liked it. I loved it. <laughs> I read an interview that the, the Hall & Oates inclusion was because Joanna Newsom is super into Hall & Oates. Oh, that's great. Yeah, which I am. Um, so I'm Sadie, but I'm but legally I'm Sarah. Yeah. Um, and I'm named for the Hall and Oates song. I'm pretty sure. Wow. So, and then Joanna Newsom has a song called Sadie. So yeah, it there all you go. Connects. It's full. So so Joanna Newsom, if you're listening, <laughs> you are my hero. And let's let's talk. I interviewed her one time, and we we're just shooting the shit after, like the interview portion, and. Uh, we were talking about TV shows, and she was saying what she liked. And she was like, oh, and of course, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And I'd totally forgotten <laughs> she was married to Andy Samberg. And I was like, oh, yeah. She had to throw that yeah. in there at the end. <laughs> But she <laughs> loves it. And But I love that show, too. But it's funny that I forgot. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I love that show. <laughs> and started talking about Captain Holt and how funny he is. I'm sure she loved that. Yeah. That's, that's sweet. <laughs> I saw her play once at... Um, how, how long have you been in Boston? A long time? Yeah, I saw her at Somerville Theater. Uh, I saw her at Mass Art in like 2006. Oh, wow. So that was like when she was with Devander Van Hart stuff. She played, maybe it wasn't Mass Art. It was like the, maybe it was the art museum. She played in like a garden courtyard and it was like very few people. Wow. And I was, um the only reason I got to go was because I somehow like, li- not I didn't lie, but I felt like I scammed my way into a role as arts editor for MIT's newspaper. Okay. It was like the coolest thing I've ever seen. I actually saw Meryl Garbus play there and she's on your new oh, record. She did. Yeah. yeah. She sings on the, um, the, the single we put out, um, ghost of a good time. I like she, that song. she does a couple backing vocals. Do you want, do you want to know why she's on it? It's kind of a funny yeah. story. So I really love the drum sound on the Tao album that, that Meryl produced. What is it called? It's the one about her her dad. I'm I'm so terrible at remembering song names and album titles, but um, it was one of my favorite records of that year. And the drum sound is like phenomenal. And so I went to work at Tiny Telephone in Oakland specifically because I really liked the drum sound on that record. And Mariam Cuttis, who was engineering the songs I recorded there, had also worked on the Tune Yard stuff as well as the Tao stuff because her, I think her husband is also an engineer who works there. So she was like, oh yeah, Meryl and I are friends. Like, I'm going to tell her that. And the vocal, the backing vocal part of that song, to me, felt really Tune Yards already, just as a coincidence. I was like, I wonder if she'll just throw some vocals in there, since the backing part is kind of inspired by how I think she sings. So it was really lucky that that that, that worked out. But yeah, I really like booked a whole session around um, liking the, the drum sound on a record she produced. Um, yeah. back to, so you're, you're writing for MIT and <laughs> yeah. what were you studying at MIT? I went for math. Okay. For whatever reason, I was very good at math in high school. So I got scouted some places for that specifically. And like the second I got to MIT, it's super, it's not that it's competitive, but it's drastically hard. I think their retention rate for some courses of study that are easier at other schools like they don't give you grades the first semester at MIT because so many people fail and they don't want that to go on your record. Right. So it's really, really rigorous. And I was just not feeling it. I think if I'd gone somewhere else, I probably would have stuck with math. And in a way, it's like a huge blessing that I went to MIT because I don't think that was not that there's like destiny, but um, I'm really happy I wound up doing music. So I went as a double major in math and music mm-hmm. and I was taking math classes as well as some like recording classes. But I started doing work with the student newspaper and I started taking writing classes um, and I got really into that. And I was just feeling super demoralized by all of the more STEM related courses I was taking and ultimately wound up. I had this great poetry instructor, Bill Corbett, who I'm actually sitting in front of a 
framed broadside that's signed by him. He passed away a couple of years ago, but he really encouraged me as a writer and kind of told me like, what are you doing here? It was a really small writing department mm-hmm. that um, at the time, like the, the big boast was that Juno Diaz was in the faculty, although um, people feel quite differently about that now. But yeah, he encouraged me sort of to drop out. And that's sort of when I focused harder on writing and started getting into writing for publications outside of student newspapers and eventually went back to school for writing in a different place. Right. And and then you were teaching as well as a professor, right? Yeah, I was a professor, not quite, but um, teaching associate. Yeah. <laughs> not quite a TA, okay. but not, definitely not a professor. Uh, yeah, I did an MFA program at UMass Amherst and I taught like basically intro comp classes for around three years. There. And did you finally quit that when the, the band had gotten big enough to do that? Or was that, you know, I did, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but it wasn't like I, I was glad to quit. I really liked that job. Yeah. And it's something I would love to do again. But at some point when I went to UMass, I'd been playing in another band in, I, I lived in New York at that time before I went up there and I was dating someone in the band. We broke up. So I went up there to kind of just do different things. And lo and behold, all the areas where my previous band had not had any success. Suddenly with the new band, it was very, things were just coming really easy. Venues that I couldn't in a million years have gotten them to book me were trying to book me all the time. I was really lucky with like the Phoenix was really supportive of Speedy super early on, which as someone who had always wanted to work in alt weeklies, that was like a It was just like incredible to me. That was like the pinnacle of success would be for me to be featured in alt weeklies. So things were coming really easy for Speedy. And we started touring, working in academia, made touring really easy because you have these long built in breaks. And at some point it was like I was teaching, but I had like a Tuesday, Thursday teaching schedule. And Wednesday was when I took my own classes. So I would like finish up teaching on Thursday, get in the van, drive to like Ohio and then by, you know, Monday night, I'm playing somewhere else eight hours away. We finish up the show, drive straight home, and I have to teach a class Tuesday morning. So I don't know how I did all that. But at some point, I was making the same amount of money from, from touring on my off days as I was the entire year through teaching salary. And it just seemed like not only would I burn out if I kept working, like, you know, thousand hour work weeks with, <laughs> between touring and, and teaching. But um, I just, you know, I was like 24 by that time. And it felt like if I was going to give it a shot to try to make music, my my real job, time is ticking. So I I quit. And yeah, it was kind of scary, but uh, it's worked out okay. Because I, that's been my my sort of job since then. Right. It's a funny thing to think about, too. It's like, if you do go back to it, you know, later in life, and and you could, but uh might be easier for me now, honestly. Yeah. Those jobs are so competitive, but I've got this weird other resume. Right, exactly. Having that life experience is almost more valuable than anything else. Yeah, in some ways, for sure. Um, so you kind of mentioned that you were dating somebody in the band. Do you generally find that's always been a bad idea? I have like dated almost no people. And my current partner of the past, I don't know how many years, long time. Um, is my label mate, Mm -hmm. but we don't play any music together. So it's almost like it's like working in the same office in different departments. And that feels fine. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, Let's see. So I promised we'd get into pavement, but we haven't gotten into pavement. Let's do it. Um, So when did you get into pavement? In high school, I got into pavement. One thing about my dad, who had left, obviously, had not worked in music in so long, but he's kept up with it. I had such a strange relationship with him growing up. And I think that's probably true for a lot of kids whose parents were never together in their eyes. But we started to get much closer when I was older and was interested in music because that was like his, even though he didn't work in it, it was his passion still. One of the, when I would have like weekends with him, the thing we would bond over was going to the record store together. And he would always have like some, to me, they seemed ancient, but probably like a 22 year old guy who knew what all the cool new releases were. And my dad picked up a lot of CDs that were like Pavement, Liz Fair, um, a lot of the stuff on Matador, like new pornographers. Um, and so we would get to to listen to them together. And my parents lived about two and a half hours away so from each other. So when I was being taken up back to my mom on Sunday, we just listened through all the CDs. So we really bonded over 
shopping for CDs, listening to them together, listening to the radio. Um, and pavement was something that, that came from like a record store clerk told him to get into it. And then when I was a teenager, like, what is this CD dad? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Makes me sound like a, maybe like 18 years old, (laughs) I'm 32. Um, but yeah, I think I got into that just from sort of pilfering through his collection. I think that's a great album title. What is this CD dad? (laughs) (laughs) It's such a silly phrase that you don't really hear much. Um, (laughs) But, you know, hearing when I first heard Speedy Ortiz, you could hear sounds like a lot of the Matador bands you referenced uh, there, yep. but without being derivative. But tell me, I guess, how it all clicked for you in the sense that this felt like something you wanted to do and, and could amalgamize these sounds. I'm, I mean, I'm never like intentionally trying to sound any of the things I'm intentionally trying to sound like are never the things that we get compared to. Like, I might be like, oh, we're going to use this vocal effect because of Aaliyah. And people still say, like, 90s college rock. <laughs> um, so, but one thing that I think really, in the same way that I say, like, doing covers really faithfully is helpful for me as a producer and figuring out how to get certain sounds. I don't play covers super often, but I did do a pavement cover band for two shows at a time when I was like, I, I was unemployed for like a couple months. And I was like, cool, I'm just going to learn every pavement song on guitar. So I think that learning all of that just for two cover sets really gave me some different tools that I hadn't used before in playing. And I think, yeah, that that was sort of a huge influence on my my playing style. Just um, I'd always been like a, a pretty big pavement fan. I think my email address was already what we you and I talked right. about um, by the time I was like, oh, let's do this fun pavement cover band. But just learning how to play all those songs and figuring out the tunings and figuring out some of the sort of finger picking arpeggio stuff that they use in that band, which is not often what you think of with like 90s rock, just gave me some some different kinds of tools that I still use. One of my favorite things seeing Speedy Ortiz was uh, Hannibal Burris coming up and playing drums with uh-huh. you. <laughs> yes. Tell me about that. Um, I was just a huge fan of Eric Andre. And obviously Hannibal was a result of that. And I think he he tweeted at South by like, I want to play with a band, just like half joking. And I was like, please come play with us. And somehow someone on our team like worked with someone on his team. So he just came and did it and played drums with us. It was really like fun for us as all fans of his comedy, but we kind of stayed in touch and became friendly <laughs> as a result of it. Uh, I wound up doing his podcast and I think we went to go see him like DJ once and we we've like hung out a couple times since then. Oh, that's great. Um, which is pretty cool. I'm 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 a fan of of him. Actually, last time I played in Chicago, uh, I went and got ice cream with him and then we went to go see some wrestling. So that was pretty fun. That's awesome. He's cool. That is that is that's quite a night. <laughs> <laughs> it was like daytime. It was oh, like, wow, even better. A really nice day. <laughs> yeah. Your path has been a winding path. You know, there was there's the math detour and but yeah. and and you you've embraced so many different styles of art whether it be teaching uh or writing poems or, or or journalism but what is it that has brought you back to music and made that your main focal point um really just luck i i think i'm very open to following opportunities as they come up even if it's something I'm not sure about or is new. And as far as like playing in bands, you know, I've done it since I was 13. I, I probably would, I, I'm, I'm certain I would have continued to be writing and recording and doing stuff regardless of whether anyone cared about my band. But I just got really lucky and, and had the opportunity to do it in a more consistent and scare quotes career like way. So I think for me, it's a combination of being open to seeing where an opportunity will lead, even if I'm not totally certain it's you know going to produce anything other than a, a fun, interesting challenge. And also just, the, you know, the internal knowledge that I'll do music no matter what happens. So um, for me, the drive is not like, let me do, you know, an album that sounds this way to open up this kind of touring or these kinds of radio opportunities. I tend to just make the stuff that I'm excited by and like, and as a music fan, something that I think I would connect to in, in the moment of, you know, whatever it is that I'm a fan of. So I think those are sort of what, what has made music um, a central thing for me. And the sort of 
for me, playing music is really about community. Like I started Speedy Ortiz because I'd moved to a new place where I didn't know anyone. And the only way I could think to make friends was to start playing shows. So I've always been, you know, in addition to playing music, like a, like a dorky, dorky fan. <laughs> and often of bands that are really not like not heralded in a big public way. So I love to like be a fan and, and be supportive of other bands that are in my community, whether they're, they're big or small. And I think that really drives me to want to stay engaged and, and keep working on things. Dorky, dorky fans unite. Playing music is about community, isn't it? Thank you, Sadie Dupuis. And hey, I hope you're a dorky, dorky fan of this show, because for listening this far, I'm going to extend a special offer to you. How would you like to receive a $100 discount on a 12-week Berkeley Online course? All you have to do? Head over to musicismylifepod.com right now and redeem this special offer. That's it. Aren't you glad you stuck around for those instructions? You'll also get a link to all sorts of free resources, so check it out, musicismylifepod.com. This episode was edited by Talia Smith, mastered by Jose David Vindis Mora, all visual assets coordinated by Mike DeBenedictus, social media by Brooke Larson, web assistance courtesy of Mark Thomas, Steve Zimmerman, and Joe McDonough. I wrote and recorded the Music Is My Life theme song, but the expert remixing comes courtesy of Lily Dickinson. Special thanks to Gabriel Reifer Cohen, Ashley Pointer, the marvelous Jacqueline Ullman, Alex Caritas, and thanks to you for listening. Take note to join us on Monday, September 28th for special guest Molly Tuttle. Stay safe, everybody. We'll talk soon.